Did you know that the oceans are being poisoned by oil? In just 10 years, the total volume of oil spills worldwide has been enough to fill 15 great pyramids of Giza in Egypt. Most of it is never recovered, silently turning coral reefs to stone, weakening sea turtles, and wiping out fishing grounds that once sustained millions of people. When billion-dollar technologies proved powerless against heavy oil and rough seas, an almost unbelievable decision was made in the Philippines. Instead of deploying advanced machinery, they released agricultural waste into the ocean. What's even more shocking is that the United Nations did not oppose this move. It praised it as one of the greenest solutions humanity has ever devised. So what exactly did the Philippines dump into the sea? How could something once thrown away stop oil pollution and help reverse an environmental disaster? All of this will be revealed by TerranWorks in this video. Not every oil spill begins with an explosion. On August 11, 2006, the oil tanker MT Solar One sank silently off the coast of the Philippines. The vessel, chartered to transport industrial fuel, suffered a failure caused by severe structural deterioration combined with overloading, leaving its hull unable to withstand rough sea conditions. There were no dramatic warnings and no major distress signals. The ship gradually lost stability and sank to a depth of approximately 3,000 feet. Going down with MT Solar One were 550,000 gallons of bunker oil, a thick, heavy fuel with strong adhesive properties commonly used by large ocean-going vessels. At the moment the ship disappeared beneath the waves, the Philippines had yet to grasp the true scale of the disaster that was unfolding. Unlike lighter oils, bunker oil does not spread quickly across the water's surface. Instead, it clumps together, sinks, and adheres stubbornly to rocks, mangrove roots, and coastal sand. These characteristics make leaks difficult to detect early and nearly impossible to clean up using conventional response methods. Just days later, the first traces of oil began to appear along the shoreline, signaling that a maritime accident had escalated into the most serious oil spill in Philippine history. From that point on, MT Solar One was no longer merely the story of a sunken ship, but the beginning of a prolonged environmental crisis that would last for years. Located in central Philippines, wedged between the islands of Panay and Negros, Gumaras had long been accustomed to the gentle rhythm of the sea in the Iloilo Strait. Yet it was precisely this strategic position guarding the entrance and exit of these waters that made the island the most visibly affected when oil from the MT Solar One spill began drifting ashore. Before the incident, Gumaras was known as a quiet island, celebrated for its white sand beaches, fertile mango orchards, and the Taklong Marine Reserve, an area where coastal ecosystems had remained relatively intact. The sea was not merely scenery, it was the lifeblood of the local community. But within just days of the oil spill, that picture changed completely. Bunker oil from offshore was carried by ocean currents toward the coast, contaminating more than 1,500 hectares of ecosystems. Mangrove forests were coated with oil along their roots and lower trunks, seagrass beds were smothered, and coral reefs in the area were directly affected at the height of a sensitive spawning season. Among the hardest hit areas was Taklong Island, the very heart of the marine reserve. The disruption extended far beyond the environment. As coastal waters became heavily polluted, authorities were forced to impose a total ban on fishing. Nearly 20,000 fishermen lost their livelihoods almost overnight. Many families left the island for Manila in search of temporary work, while some children were forced to interrupt their schooling as household incomes collapsed. At the same time, tourism, the economic backbone of Gumaras was brought to a near standstill. Beaches that once attracted visitors were closed, activities within the marine reserve were suspended, and the revenue that had sustained the community vanished. Losses were estimated at billions of pesos, underscoring that the oil spill did not merely devastate an ecosystem, but plunged the entire island into a profound socioeconomic crisis. After oil began washing ashore along the coast of Guimaras, 
the Philippines quickly activated its full set of oil spill response procedures in line with international standards. Containment booms were deployed to corral the slick, mechanical skimmers and absorbent materials were brought in, and specialized teams attempted to deal with contaminated sediments. On paper, these were well-established measures, techniques used in many countries and proven effective in past incidents. But the reality in Gumaras was entirely different. Bunker oil, thick, viscous, and tar-like, did not spread quickly enough to be contained. Instead, it clumped together, clung stubbornly to rocks and mangrove roots, and mixed into the coastal sand. Equipment designed for lighter oils became slow and ineffective against this type of fuel. The more responders tried to recover it, the deeper the oil was dragged into fragile coastal ecosystems. The situation was even more dire in the Taklong Marine Reserve. Located far from the mainland, with narrow access routes and limited infrastructure, the area was almost impossible to reach with heavy machinery. The Philippines also lacked specialized cleanup vessels or high-capacity skimmers like those available in the United States or Europe. As time passed and oil continued to accumulate, modern technological solutions gradually remained only on paper. Ultimately, under mounting pressure as contamination spread, the Philippines was forced to choose the simplest and most bitter option of all, mobilizing local residents to collect the oil by hand. As standard cleanup measures stalled one by one, the Philippines was forced to search for an alternative solution. In that context, an idea that sounded almost unbelievable began to circulate, using human hair to absorb spilled oil. Thousands of hair salons across the Philippines were called upon to collect hair. From Manila to smaller cities, containers were placed outside salons, while students and volunteers willingly cut their own hair to donate. The collected hair was then packed into nylon mesh, forming long floating booms that were deployed along the coast of Gumaras and around environmentally sensitive areas. This approach was not entirely improvised. From a scientific perspective, human hair has a high capacity to absorb oil while repelling water, thanks to its surface structure and naturally hydrophobic properties. Each strand acts like a tiny capillary, allowing oil to cling along its entire length without swelling or sinking, unlike many synthetic materials. Lightweight and buoyant, hair booms can remain on the water's surface for extended periods, continuing to absorb oil even under unfavorable sea conditions. As soon as the idea of using human hair to deal with oil spills was put into practice, many scientists expressed skepticism. While some viewed it as proof of the potential of biological materials in emergency response, previous cases showed that the issue was far from straightforward. During the 2007 Costco Busan oil spill in San Francisco Bay, hair mats proved highly effective at absorbing oil. But this very success raised new concerns. Human hair decomposes slowly in marine environments, is difficult to manage after collection, and often contains dyes and styling chemicals that pose a risk of secondary pollution. For these reasons, human hair has been regarded only as a temporary emergency measure, not a sustainable long-term solution. The doubt surrounding the use of human hair left behind an unresolved question. Could the Philippines find another natural material, one that was effective, safe, and durable enough to be deployed at scale? The answer did not come immediately. It would take nearly 17 years after the MT Solar One disaster to emerge. In 2023, a vessel carrying roughly 370,000 gallons of industrial fuel capsized off the coast of Batangas, directly threatening fish farms and nearby coastal communities. Within hours, the sea began to change color, reviving memories of what Gamaras had once endured. But this time, the Philippines responded differently. Instead of turning to human hair or waiting for cleanup equipment from abroad, the Philippine Coast Guard acted immediately. Sacks of dried coconut husks were hauled to the shoreline, tied together into long floating barriers, and deployed into the water to contain and absorb the spilled oil. This decision was not a hasty reaction born of crisis, but the result of experience accumulated over time. Just a few months before the Batangas incident, 
During a smaller oil spill east of Mindoro, local residents had already tested this approach. They collected coconut husks from around their villages, packed them into mesh, and created improvised oil-absorbing booms. The results exceeded expectations. The oil was effectively contained and easy to recover, while the material was readily available and did not carry the risk of secondary pollution associated with human hair. What was used in the oil-absorbing booms was not raw coconut shells, but coir, the fibrous material extracted during the production of ropes and traditional handicrafts. Lightweight, inexpensive, and naturally oil-absorbent, coir had long been ubiquitous across the Philippines, yet it was rarely recognized as a material with environmental value. Few people notice that the Philippines was once the world's largest coconut producer and remains among the global leaders today. About 26% of the country's farmers depend directly on coconut cultivation, generating millions of tons of coconut husks each year that are ultimately discarded. While coconut water, flesh, oil, trunks, and leaves are widely utilized, the husk, which accounts for more than one-third of the fruit's weight, is often treated as waste. This is not unique to the Philippines. The same situation exists in Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, and Vietnam. Globally, an estimated 85 to 90 percent of coir goes unused, piling up around processing facilities, even as these very countries frequently face coastal oil spill incidents. It is precisely this paradox that has prompted a reassessment of coir from a neglected byproduct into a readily available, low-cost resource well-suited to local conditions in the fight against oil pollution. You know, the British recognized the unique value of coir very early on. During World War II, they used coconut fiber to make life jackets, ship mooring ropes, and camouflage nets, calling it the golden fiber of the Pacific. Not because it was rare, but because it was lightweight, durable, buoyant, and resistant to decay in seawater. Modern science shows that coir is far more powerful than people once realized. This material contains around 45% lignin, one of the highest lignin contents in the plant kingdom. Lignin acts like a natural oil magnet, allowing coir to absorb oil efficiently while repelling water. Its twisted, porous fiber structure, filled with millions of microscopic capillaries, enables coir to trap crude oil and even absorb heavy metals commonly found in industrial pollution. Compared to human hair, the difference becomes clear. Hair is effective only in the short term, difficult to handle after recovery, and carries the risk of bringing salon chemicals into the environment. Coir, by contrast, is a clean agricultural material, stable in salt water, and can be reused or safely treated through biological processes. It is precisely this sustainability that allows coir to move beyond a stopgap measure and become a long-term option in oil spill response strategies. While biological solutions such as coir are gaining attention, a troubling reality continues to unfold quietly. Oil spills on a global scale are once again on the rise. Although the number of major oil spills has declined compared to the 1980s and 1990s, their frequency over the past decade has increased relative to the period before, especially in regions with dense maritime traffic across Asia, Europe, and South America. In 2024 alone, six major oil spills and four medium-scale incidents were recorded, releasing a total of nearly 22 million pounds of oil into the ocean. The reasons are not difficult to identify. Ships are becoming larger, weather patterns more extreme, and the volume of oil transported by sea remains exceptionally high. Even countries with advanced technological capabilities are not immune. In the United States, oil spill response still relies largely on familiar measures. Deploying containment booms to confine slicks, using large capacity skimmer vessels to recover oil from the surface, and combining these efforts with monitoring systems based on satellites, aircraft, and drones to detect spills early and track their movement. However, these approaches come with very high costs and depend heavily on modern infrastructure, making them difficult to deploy quickly in small island regions or developing countries. This contrast underscores a critical reality. There is no single solution that works everywhere. 
And it is precisely here that locally available biological materials like coir are opening up a more affordable, flexible path forward. From human hair in moments of emergency to coir, a seemingly worthless agricultural byproduct, the Philippines has shown that solutions do not always have to come from expensive laboratories or global supply chains. Sometimes they lie right within local natural conditions and the knowledge of the communities themselves. What do you think about this approach? Share your perspective and don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss the next journeys with Terran Works.